Can human qualities or attributes which go with personality be suggested and artistic institutions which parallel them be reflected in music? Actually, accomplishing this is a problem more or less arbitrary to an open mind, more or less impossible to a prejudiced mind. That which the composer intends to represent as high vitality sounds like something quite different to different listeners. That which I like to think suggests the real solution to nature. To another, who sees something like Hawthorne's conception of the relentlessness of an evil conscience. And to the rest of our friends, but a series of unpleasant sounds, how can the composer be held accountable? Beyond a certain point, responsibility is more or less undermineable. The outside characteristics, that is, the points furthest away from the verging, are obvious to mostly anyone. A child knows a strain of joy from one of sorrow. Those a little older know the dignified from the frivolous. The spring song from the season in which the melancholy days have come through, and there are not glorious hope in autumn. But where is the definite expression of late spring against early summer, of happiness against optimism? A painter paints a sunset. Can I really paint the setting sun? In some century to come, when the school children will whistle popular tunes and quarter tunes, when the diatonic scale will be as obsolete as the pentatonic is now, perhaps then these borderland experiences may be both easily expressed and readily recognized. But maybe music was not intended to satisfy the curious definiteness of man. Perhaps, and maybe, it is better to hope that music may always be a transcendental language in the most extravagant sense, possibly the power of literally distinguishing these shades of abstraction. Human attributes are definite enough when it comes to their description, but the expression of them, or the paralleling of them, has to be a sort of a more or less arbitrary, but we believe that their expression may be less vague that the basic distinction of this art dualism is kept in mind. It is morally certain that the higher part is founded, as Stir suggests, on something that has to do with those kinds of unselfish human interests, which we call knowledge and morality. Knowledge, not in the sense of erudition, but as a kind of creation of creative truth. This allows us to assume that the higher and more important value of the dualism is exposed of what may be called reality, quality, spirit, or substance. Against the lower value of form, quantity, or manner, of these terms, substance seems to be up to us the most cogent and comprehensive of the higher and manner for the undervalued. Substance in a high art quality suggests the body of a conviction that has its birth in a spiritual consciousness, whose youth is nourished in the moral consciousness, and whose maturity as well of all this growth is then represented in a mental image. This is appreciated by the intuition and somehow translated into expression by manner, and process is made less important than it seems or is suggested by the foregoing. In fact, we apologize for this attempted definition. So it seems that substance is too definite to an analyze in more specific terms. It is practically undescribable. Institutions, artistic or not, will sense it. Process unknown. Perhaps it is an unexplained consciousness of being nearer to God or being nearer the devil, of approaching truth or an approaching unreality. A silent something felt in the truth of nature and turner against the truth of art in Botticelli or in all the fine thinking of Ruskin, against the fine sonnets of Kipling or in the wide expanse of Titian, against the narrow expanse of Capraccio or in some such distinction that Pope sees between what he calls Homer's invention and Virgil's judgment. Apparently, an inspired imagination against an artistic care, a sense of the difference between Dr. Bushnell's knowing God and knowing about God. A more vivid exp explanation or illustration may be found in the differences between Emerson and Poe. The former seems to be almost wholly substance and the later manner, the measure in artistic satisfaction of Poe's manner and equal to the manner of spiritual satisfaction in Emerson's substance. The total value of practically undescribable. Institutions, artistic or not, will sense it, process unknown. 
Perhaps it is an unexplained consciousness of being nearer to God or being near the devil, of approaching truth or approaching unreality, a silent something felt in the truth of nature in Turner against the truth of art in Botticelli or in the fine thinking of Ruskin. Tithian against the narrow expanse of Capraccio, or in some distinction, that Pope sees between what he calls Homer's invention and Virgil's just judgment, apparently an inspired imagination against an artistic core, a sense of the difference, perhaps, between Dr. Bushnell's knowing The measure in artistic satisfaction of Poe's manner is equal to the measure of spiritual satisfaction in Emerson's substance. The total value of each man is high, but Emerson's is higher than Poe's because substance is higher than manner, because substance leans towards optimism. It has. Oh.